Okay, good morning, everybody. We are on the Gemara Brachas, Daf Chof Ahmed Aleph. And uh, a couple more pieces of Agata to Gemara until we get to the Mishnah uh, to today or tomorrow and uh, move more in a halachic direction. <clears throat> the last topic was dealing with certain issues of Tznius of uh, proper d- dress. And we had the story of one of the rabbis uh, who uh, was Moser Nefesh, as it was, uh, Rav Ada Barava, to make sure that other women were dressed appropriately. So while we're on the topic of appropriate uh, behavior um, and, and who is obliged or not, the Gemara tells us two interesting stories. And again, uh, I'm giving you a caveat. We have to remember who we're talking about and uh, their great stature. So, you know, people look at this Gemara without any other background and could be aghast at such a statement. And this is the statement. Rav Gittel have a ruggle to have a Rav Gittel, one big rabbi, it was his practice to go over the Yosif Ashare Ditvila and he would sit at the women's entrance uh, to the mikvah, which is usually a place where men do not belong, okay? And Amr <clears throat> he would say to the women, immerse this way and immerse this way. So it seems he was giving them guidance how to immerse in the mikvah. So <clears throat> obviously you, this would prompt the following question. Amrile Rabona, the rabbi said to him, they were aware of his practice, and they said, Lo ka mistavi mar miyetsara, is the master not afraid of the evil inclination? I mean, you're with, he, he's looking at women who do not have clothes on. Since when does the Torah give a rabbi permission to look at a woman without clothes, even if it is to instruct them in halacha? Clearly, this is not to be done today at all. So how in the world is this done? So so he said to them, Damien ba'apai, they seem to me ki ka'akoi chivore, like white geese, and they not, do not entice me at all. Okay, so this Gemara obviously needs a lot of explanation, and I don't know why, but Art Scroll chose to give no commentary on this. That's uh, an interesting uh, uh, observation, why they wouldn't, uh, knowing that anybody and everybody can get their hold on an art scroll, and it would, I guess would help to have some explanation. Be that as it may, uh, there's similar Gemaras. There's another Gemara, I can't remember if it's Rabbi Yochan or another Tana, another Masechta, that would say at a wedding, this rabbi would pick a kala up on his shoulders and dance with her. And the student said, Rebbe, are we supposed to do this too? So he said, well, to me, it's like I'm holding two sticks. So if you feel that way, then you could do it too. But nobody did. So again, how do we understand this? So <clears throat> I think what we learned on Friday, at the Friday late afternoon tish, I think those words that we learned um, will be helpful. Um, and over there, we, we learned um, the words from the Degel Machana Ephraim. And he said as follows. He said that everything that exists in this world is something that has been um, exchanged from a, from a greater spiritual reality. Which means... Hashem created the world using the letters of the Aleph base. Hashem created the world with his divine energy. And that is the source of all reality. Again, and and to make it clear, when a person, uh, when a scientist looks at water, so when me and you look at water, we just see this liquid that can get you wet or that can quench your thirst or can put out a fire. And that's to the extent that we look at water. A scientist, a real scientist, looks at water and he sees two molecules of hydrogen 
and one molecule of oxygen for every little bit of water that exists there. He sees it in terms of its scientific principles. He looks much beyond the water and he sees exactly what it is and not the superficial reality of what it is. And he has a deeper understanding what it is. And therefore, he's a lot, he, he, he does a lot of things with water scientifically with experiments that me and you wouldn't even know how to do because we don't even understand what a hydrogen molecule looks like. But he, that's how he sees it. Um, so what, what that really means on a spiritual level, when a tzaddik looks at water, he looks at the letter, he only sees the letters of the olive base when that water exists. He sees two molecules of mem and one molecule of yud. And he sees that it is the mayim, it is the, those letters which represent different powers of the source of God's will in that water. This is way, so lahavdo. Just as the scientist approaches water from a much deeper physical reality, the tzaddik approaches water from a much deeper, we'll call mystical reality. And what we explained from the words of the Degel Machan Ephraim is that everything that it starts in God's realm, the holy letters, they are exchanged, as it were, and brought into this world in such a physical level that does not remotely reflect the spiritual holiness of what it is rooted in. And it is the job of every Jew to, as it were, redeem those letters and bring them up to their reality. And that's by understanding the deepest, deepest source of everything's existence and use it exactly the way the Almighty wanted to and to bring it back to God with the illuminated factor of what it's, it really is. Now, this was exactly Adam HaRishon's state. First man, if you look carefully, it says um, uh, that the first man was there with his wife. They were unclothed and they were not ashamed. They were not ashamed. And Rashi right there says, why were they not ashamed? Because they did not yet have a Yetzer Hara, because they did, it, they did not have a Yetzer Hara that was internalized to them. And uh, let me back it up. They said they did not yet have any concept of Tznius yet. They had no concept of Tznius, of, of, of uh, modesty, did not exist. Why? Because they did not yet internalize the Yetzir Hara into them, which seems to be a very counterintuitive concept. If you think about that, you'd figure, you know, it's the Yetzir Hara does not want you to have Tznius. So that's a very fascinating Rashi, what Rashi is saying, which leads us to a much deeper, deeper concept. You weren't expecting such a deep class today, guys, but it's, it's important because otherwise if you look at this Gemara and you go, this is nuts. So therefore, you know, this, this is why you have to have a Rebbe who teaches you things. Like, and I'm lucky I had a Rebbe who taught me things. So if, if you look, at, and this is specifically, I'll just tell you as a historical footnote, in uh, 19, let me get the exact year, graduate 74, 1976, I spent a, uh, a summer seminar in New York, in Torah Masora, and I was privileged to hear from the greatest of educators at that time, and one of them was a Rabbi Shraga Silverstein. I don't know if he's still alive. He's translated many books, many, a long time ago. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is the class that he gave, not on this Gemara, but on the topic. And uh, that's a long time ago, 1976. And I remember it, I took copious notes and I still have those notes. So I was privileged to hear that. So if, uh, Hashem gave me that privilege is for me to share with you. So let me continue. And I'm gonna tell you, it's a little bit of a deep concept and there'll be a lot to think about. 
But anyway, the Rambam in Mora Nevuchim discusses, brings the following question. And he presents this as a, a skeptic asked him and said, it doesn't seem that it's fair what God did. It seems that if you do a sin, you should be punished. And it seems that Adam and Eve did a sin and they were not punished. Why? Because when Hashem told uh, them not to eat from the tree of knowledge, of course he said, and if you will eat it, you'll bring mortality to the world. But it also said uh, that uh, once they ate from the tree of knowledge, it said that now you've become like God to discriminate between good and evil. If you look at the Psukim in the third chapter, after they ate from the tree of knowledge, God says, whoa, 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 behold. They now have become like me to know the difference between good and evil. That seems to be a pretty good thing. To know there is a good and evil, that's an amazing thing to know the difference between good and evil. And they got that because they sinned? Well, I guess we should all sin. We get such good things. To which the Rambam answers, the Rambam answers, maybe for you and I, it'll be a good thing to be able to discriminate between good and evil. But for first man, it was a terrible descent of his spiritual reality. And the Rambam explains that man, because he was created in the image of God, which means among many things, is he was created with a intellect like God's, not as, uh, not as, as uh, the same amount of intellect, but of a similar nature on a, mac, on a micro scale. And what do we know about God's intellect? We know the seal of God is MS, is truth. And God looks at the world in a way different than me and you look at the world. He looks at everything in this world in terms of MS and Sheker, true and false. Because God is true, whatever um, is, is correct and proper, we'll say, I'll explain, is true. And the opposite is false. Now you ask me, what am I, what am I saying? So let me give you an understanding. Two plus two equals four. Tell me the following. Is, it a, is that a good statement or is it a true statement? True. True. Why can't I say it's good? Why can't I say that's a good statement? Because good is using a subjective value while true is an objective value. Let me give you another example. What if I say to you two plus two equals five? Would you say it's a bad statement or a false statement? It's yeah, false. Oh, why can't I say it's bad? Because again, that's, that's putting moral equivalency. It's, it's using terms that are not appropriate. Right? Math is very, you know, clear cut, true or false. That's the way it is. So therefore, when you, uh, the way, if you look at the world from God's perspective, everything is either true or false. There's nothing for us to analyze over here based on other criteria. It's, it's true or false. And therefore, when you look at a, um, a but once you, you're going to use words like good or bad, then you're using human understanding of trying to figure out if this is a proper thing or not. So let me give you an example. If you see a headhunter, a cannibal chasing after somebody, wanting to kill them and eat them for breakfast, and you'd want to stop them, you'd be chasing after them, what would you say? Stop doing it. What you're doing is, what we're bad. doing, bad or false? Bad. <laughs> bad. You wouldn't say it's false. But Adam Harishon, before he sinned with the divine intellect, he'd say, stop doing that. That is false. That's as ridiculous as two plus two equals five. It's just not possible to do such a thing. Now, to look at the entire world in that fashion, that needs absolute objectivity. 
absolute objectivity. And Hashem, who is absolutely objective, there's no emotions that direct what he feels or understands. He created, and that's his seal is truth. So when, when Hashem says, don't kill, because killing is absolutely false, it undoes the whole purpose of creation. It, it makes absolutely no logical sense. Now, here's the point. First man had that kind of clear vision. And with that vision, it's impossible to sin. You can't sin. It's like, you know, because like, what do you mean? Well, maybe he'd want to eat some trafe one day. No, no, no. If you understand what trafe really is, it's like eating arsenic. It's arsenic for the soul. Now, no, we're not talking about crazy people. No, we're talking about people who, have, who are normal. A normal person, no matter how sad they are, they don't take arsenic. If they're mentally stable, they don't. Because arsenic will kill you. If God tells you that eating trafe is spiritual arsenic, you are killing yourself spiritually, it's not saying what's well, a bad thing to do. It's totally false. It, it doesn't even come into the realm of truth. On the other hand, and that's how Adam looked at the world before the sin. Now, let me ask you one other question. A human being not wearing clothes, would you say that that person is unclothed? Or would you say that the person is uncovered? Or let me use terms a little bit. I wouldn't want to use this term, but it makes a little comes across a little better. Would you say if a person doesn't have clothes on that they're uncovered or they're naked? Well, before you answer that question, let me ask you another question. Uh, it's Shabbos, and you have your table. Usually, you have a nice Shabbos cover on the table, right? What if the husband comes home and sees a cover, no cover on the table? And the husband's going to comment on that. Is he going to say that the table is naked or that it's unclothed or it's uncovered? Uncovered. Uncovered. Why didn't it say naked? <laughs> well, because the table doesn't really have to be covered. There's no negative connotation to a table that's not covered. Correct? Why? Because it's a table, for God's sake. <laughs> On the other hand, today, if you would see a person walking through Bathurst Street without clothes on, you would not say, you know, maybe you'd be using nicer um, uh, use of your tongue and say, you know, that person is uncovered. uncovered. But you wouldn't, you'd mean to say that person is naked. There is a concept of a person's not covered versus a table not covered. Something's a lot worse over there. Would you not agree? Now the question is why? Well, the answer is like this. Adam Harishom, Adam Harishom, when he was first created with the intellect of truth and false, he saw his body and Chava's body for exactly what it was which was an earth suit for the nisham. And the body was no different than a tablecloth is to a table that an earth suit, the body is to the soul. So therefore, the body, what is the body? The body is merely a covering to the soul because a soul cannot exist on planet earth unless it has a body. And that is the only function of the body is to enable to be a domicile for the soul and to be able to do things that the soul requires that the human being should do. That's all it is. Let me say better. Nowadays, they have robots, right? Now, let's say the good old-fashioned robot, not the ones now they're making robots that look like human beings. They're like just a regular robot. Let's say you had a robot as your maid. They have these things in hospitals, you know, these things that just go up and down to clean the floors. Would you have to put clothes on that? 
No, it's just a bunch of metal and bolts. So if that's all it is, there's no point to cover it up. Which, why would you cover a robot? There's nothing negative connotation of an unclothed robot. That's the way robots created. In God's eyes, in God's eyes, what is the human body? It is merely a covering of the soul and that's all it is. So why in the world would you have to put clothing on top of clothing? Let's say, right, you understand what's going on over here. But that's, if you truly understand the true aspect of what clothing is. And Hashem gifted man with such an incredible intellect, he saw things so clear, exactly what it is, without any type of bias or extra thought of what it is. So therefore, if you really, really only saw the body as a cover of the soul, you would never think to cover it up. And therefore, the Torah says before they ate from the sin of uh, the tree of knowledge, it says they were unclothed and they were not ashamed. Now, of course, me and you would say, what are you talking about? You don't have clothes on. Can't you, aren't, why aren't you ashamed? So Rashi knows your question. Rashi knows your question. I don't understand. These are smart people. They, don't they know they don't have any clothes on? Rashi says, because they had not yet been introduced to the concept of tznius. Why? Because they had not yet eaten from the tree of knowledge and internalized the Yetzir Hara. Now, what do we know about the Yetzir Hara? There's two principal aspects to the Yetzir Hara. Two principal aspects. One is what we'll call the animalistic drive which is only a potentially dangerous thing. Like you're hungry, you want to eat, you're thirsty. You know, there's nothing inherently evil with that, it's a, but it's a potential problem. You let it get away with you, and then you become a slave to your drives, then you can get yourself in all kinds of trouble. But that, that's not the worst part of the HR. There's a second part of the HR, which is called de my own imagination, where the HR begins to have you think thoughts that are not based in reality. And we start thinking that things have certain uh, aspects that are totally not true. And it plays on our imagination and therefore it causes us to make terrible decisions. Let me give you a simple example of this. This was an example I remember Rabbi Silverstein gave at the time. And for us uh, more mature adults will remember this. There used to be a cigarette. I don't know if they had it in South Africa, Tony. There used to be a cigarette called Salem. And there was a really great jingle. This is going to really jog your memories, guys. <laughs> it's a great jingle. If you remember one of the earliest Salem commercials, when you could still have commercials, right? We're dating ourselves. It's love commercials. You have this young romantic couple frolicking through rolling uh, green grass and beautiful picturesque waterfalls. It's a really romantic kind of scene. Of course, they're smoking cigarettes and they have this great line. You can take Salem out of the country. Who knows the second half of the jingle? But, but, you, but you can't, can't take, take, can't take the country out of Salem. Good, Shelly, you got it. You I don't know if that's to be proud of. <laughs> oh, well, listen, you, <laughs> you got a good memory. That's what you, anyway. But what what was that? Now you have to say about advertising. Advertising works on on our uh, hitting our dimayon, our hit our hitting our dimayon, our imagination. Now, if if Adam Arisho looks at a cigarette. He says, what are you saying? What you're saying is absolutely false. You, Di Mayon is saying, if you smoke a cigarette, you're going to be living an amazing life, rolling green hills, and you're going to get a good looking girl to be your friend for life. It's all because of that cigarette. That's what they're doing. 
That is classic Gates heart. Now, Emmis will say, what are you talking about? You're trying to tell me that tobacco and toilet paper is good for me? It is carcinogenic. You are killing me. The MS is you're killing me. But the Dimayon says this is amazing. Now, that is all thanks to Mr. Yetzirah, thanks to Adam Rishon, who ingested that tree of knowledge, created that now our whole psyche has been warped. And instead of, let's give an example, if we're going back in time, the difference between Spock and Kirk. Spock only can do things if they're logical. There's no emotion here. And he'd always say, that is not logical. We would, so to speak, not totally, but we have a certain Spock aspect, other reason, a certain Spock aspect. You don't do things that are not logical. You do not smoke a cigarette because you will kill yourself. No, 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 it's the girl, it's the rolling hills. No, 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 that is just your demayon, and I'm not gonna be fooled by that. Doesn't mean to say you being sure to have emotion, but emotion based on MS and, and check. So now Adam Arishon, before he sinned, he lived in an MS and Sheker world. And therefore, a person, that means he saw everything, as I explained, he saw everything the way the Degel Machen Ephraim explained. He says, they're all letters of the olive base that are just coming in the letters Gimel, Vav, Face, or Feast that say goof. That's all it is. It's just letters of the olive base. It's just, it's just, it's just a, a tablecloth. Why should I have any concepts of sensuality when I'm looking at an earth suit? So that's what Rashi's saying. The concept of sneus of modesty, unfortunately, is only a concept that exists when you have a Yitzhahara that's working on your Dimayon, trying to make you think it's something other than it is. So they were not ashamed because there were tables that were not with a tablecloth on because it wasn't Shabbos. After they ate from the tree of knowledge, now God says, now they are Yode Tovara. They descended from a world of crystal clarity to a world of now intellectual and emotional debate where all of a sudden they start looking at their body and they don't necessarily see an earth suit anymore. Because the Yetzirah now is coming in and says, you know, she's pretty good looking, isn't she? Did you ever notice the shape of her body, her face, whatever the Yetzirah was saying? And they say, oh, we better cover ourselves up. All of a sudden, because they didn't see their bodies in the MS and Sheker way. Okay, there's a lot of questions on this and I don't want, you know, I had to get just the main part we needed. Okay, what does it mean he'll be like God? And what, you know, how could they make this thing? They never answer. That's all great questions, but it's beyond, we're just trying to stick to the DAF over here. But now, so what happens is there are certain tzaddikim who are able to work on their spiritual personality that they, at a certain way, can reach the level of first man. This is not something me and you ever can expect to reach. But there's certain tzaddikim, this is how great the human being is. He can reach in and deep and be able to, through the Torah, be able to analyze reality exactly like that. So if you are Rav Gittel, and Rav Gittel has totally submerged himself in Torah and totally submerged himself in understanding the true reality and to see things in an Emerson checker way. And let me give one more example, because I know you're going to say, well, I don't know, Rabbi, you're kind of trying to excuse his behavior. So let me give you one more example. Okay, does anybody have a problem if their wife is ill and she has to go to a doctor and the best doctor in the world is a male and he has to see if, God forbid, the wife has breast cancer? And we'll have to have her take off her blouse to be able to notice and to see and to feel if there's something wrong that could kill her. Does anybody have a problem with a man doing that? Would you warn your wife to stop fooling around with this man? No. And the Gemara says, you know why? Because when you go into a doctor's office who's a professional, I'm not talking about, you know, people who abuse her, I'm talking a real professional. 
The doctor does not view your wife as a sensual person. As pretty as your wife could be, the doctor views your wife as a piece of clinical meat. And that's how he should look at her because he's looking for one thing, cancer, how it evolves the body, how the molecules and this and that. And he's been trained to know if he feels certain things, he's not feeling for any sense of sensuality. He's trying to feel where is the disease. He's trained, it's a, cl it's a, it's a clinician. So the laws of, listen carefully, gentlemen, the laws of Tznius for a professional doctor do not exist in the office because he's not viewing the woman as something sensual. However, guess what? If your wife sees the doctor outside the office at a wedding, the laws of Tznius apply 100% because he's not a clinician anymore looking at it. So that we all understand by a doctor, so certainly Rav Gittel, in Torah, if he really is so submerged in seeing what a human being is, and every time he looks at a human being, all he sees is an earth suit that's meant to fulfill the mitzvahs. So he knows one thing. These women are trying to do the mitzvah of going to the mikvah, and in those days, they didn't have such mikvahs like we have, and you have to be much, much more complicated to dip into the mikvah to do it halachically correctly. Remember, if the woman goes in the mikvah and makes a mistake, and let's say one hair is sticking out of the water. That means her going to the mikvah is 100% not kosher. And if she lives with her husband, they're punished with kares. So it's a very serious thing. And in those days, they didn't have such plush, beautiful mikvahs with, with, you know, with all the fancy things. You know, there was dirt all over the place. And they, it was not so easy. Obviously, if he was doing that, it meant many of the other people were not qualified. And therefore, he says they're like white geese because for him, they were exactly. It shows you what levels a person can reach. And again, as I conclude the class, I say, as they say in many of these TV shows, do not practice, caution, do not practice this at home. This is not something me and you can ever say, although there are people who will take advantage of women who are charismatic figures and will... Uh, compromise people by suggesting that we're also spiritual. And people obviously have distorted this with nudist colonies and all these things. So we're back to, <clears throat> there is a bunch of corrupt people. But we're talking about a person who really sees the world for what it is. And that's really what happened at Har Sinai, where Hashem really showed us the world for what it is. So for someone like Rav Gittel, he is like the spiritual doctor. It does not apply. It's not meant for us to learn from this so to speak, to follow it, but to understand what levels that a person can come to and to appreciate what the human being is. Okay, that's the uh, presentation for today. If you have any questions, uh, you can either email me uh, or uh, and we can maybe continue this idea tomorrow, but I think that's as good as a presentation. Okay. Thank you, I see the dog. Thank you. Okay, take care. Have a Thank good day. Have a yeah, good day. Alexander, we are learning. I lose Alexander. I think I'm. Oh, no, I'm here.